slide presentation of vestments at St. Benedict's Convent. Our original mother house in Eichstätt, the Abbey of St. Walburg, is for us at St. Benedict's Convent, a link between the 11th and the 20th century. The religious and cultural values of the Middle Ages, preserved, nurtured, and transmitted faithfully by the nuns at St. Walburg, have, without doubt, affected our philosophy of life our aspirations and accomplishments. Embroidered picture of St. Wahlberg from Abtei Wahlberg, Eichstätt, Germany. We are fortunate to have a sample of the needle craft of the Benedictine nuns at the Abbey of St. Wahlberg, Eichstätt, West Germany, the community from which our community stems. This embroidered picture of St. Wahlberg made in Eichstätt is an instance that shows how their needle craft influenced our needlework. The selection of color and the stitches that effect the shading of the garment and the couching of the gold thread that makes the halo are signs that indicate the roots of our needleworkers here at St. Benedict's Convent. Probably the rose cope is the oldest vestment we have. It was made by Sister Felicitas Knapp, Sister Justina Knapp's sister perhaps in the early 1890s. This rose humeral veil belongs with the rose cope. A humeral veil is also called a benediction veil because it is worn over the shoulders and then used with the hands to hold the monstrance when giving benediction with the blessed sacrament. The long beak of the white pelican is furnished with a sack which serves as a container for the small fish that it feeds its young. In the process of feeding, the bird presses the sack against its neck in such a way that it seems to open its breasts with its bill. The reddish tinge of its breast plumage and the redness of the tip of its beak fostered the folkloristic notion that it actually drew blood from its own breast. Thus the action of the pelican became a fitting symbol of Christ's shedding of his own blood on the cross to redeem us, to give us life. A detail of the hood shows the embroidered roses at the ends of the humeral veil. Again one marvels at the shading and exquisite naturalness of the roses. On this slide is shown a seamless surplice made of fillet instead of cloth. Sister Hildegard Hassler made it. Fillet is a type of netting made by knotting thread with the help of a special type of needle and wooden rod, Stab in German. It was plied by some of our sisters in the early decades of this century to make the foundation for elaborate and intricate lace. Into this net-like fabric, floral designs, symbols, letters, or figures could be worked. This is a close-up of the fillet um, work uh, done on the surfaces. It shows how all these threads had to be knotted together and to, to give it the design of it squares, and how the um, embroidery work was uh, embedded into, th into that design. Shown here is another seamless fillet surplus with tatting attached to the bottom and to the sleeves. This surplus was made by Sister Felicitas Knapp about 1925. The gold chasuble is one of a set of five vestments which were made around 1920. This set is made of brocade 22 inches in width and was hand woven in Switzerland. At that time, this fabric sold at $25 a yard. It has gold thread in the woof. Matching the subtly rich floral design at the seams required considerable skill and precision. The Jubilee Medal of St. Benedict, struck in 1880 at Monte Cassino, furnished the fundamental theme for the design of the embroidery work on this set of vestments. The cross with the inscription cross of Holy Father Benedict as found on the other side of the medal. Variations of the cross design are found on the various vestments of this set. 
This set was used for the first time on Profession Day, July 11, in 1924. This date has been verified by two of the 1924 profession class, Sister Corsina Harewers, who was Assistant Sacristan of Sacred Heart Chapel at the time, and Sister Anne-Marie Schoeweiler, who then worked in the vestment department. In the 1920s and 1930s, the vestment department reached its high point of productivity. They were asked at that time to uh, make a set of vestments for the Holy Angels Parish, which then served as the cathedral. Notice the uh, interesting uh, array of cherub-like uh, angels uh, in, on the vestment because of the name of the Holy Angels Parish. A close-up of the angel uh, sets shows how realistically uh, the style was in, uh, at that time, uh, trying to make them uh, very human-looking uh, and uh, natural-looking. Uh, Mother uh, Louise liked this uh, set of vestments so much that when she saw it and it was going to go to Holy Angels Parish, she asked the vestment department to make another set in their leisure time uh, for the convent chapel. And so uh, later on, that is what, what was done. Another close-up of the angel motif shows how each angel that was embroidered was unique. Uh, that was a, 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 a very wonderful quality of these vestments. Sister Justina Knapp, however, was uh, about uh, being more creative for the next set of vestments, as we will see later, when they made the set, the angel set for the convent chapel. Uh, she did not repeat the uh, cherub-like uh, angels, uh, but rather looked for a, a pattern in the angels that were uh, in the chapel, uh, the wood-carved angels holding up the Vatican in, uh, in chapel, and they were more of the uh, Levitical s style of uh, artistry, which, which uh, we will see later. The purple cope with the symbols of the Passion is used during Lent and Passion Tide. On the front of the cope are six symbols, and on the back are four symbols, all pertain to the Passion. The front six symbols with the thistle motif are on the following slide. They are the Roman numeral 30 with several little silver discs which stand for the 30 pieces of silver that Judas Iscariot got from the chief priest for the betrayal of Jesus. The pillar of scourging. The spear and ladder. The spear stands for Longinus who opened the side of Jesus. The abbreviation INRI for the inscription Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, which Pilate wrote and put on the cross as the charge against Jesus. The dice for the casting of lots by the soldiers to determine who should get the seamless coat. The hammer and pliers. On the back of the coat, the hood, is the bark of Peter. In the boat stands a dominant key row with the letters Alpha and Omega on either side. The key row is the monogram for Christ. The boat is named Sancta Ecclesia, Holy Mother Church. One interpretation of the boat sign for Holy Mother Church is that Jesus Christ entrusted the church to Peter, a fisherman, and his successors. Four smaller symbols are also found on the hood of the coat. They can be seen on this slide. Clockwise around the Sancta Ecclesia they are torch, spear, and club, whip of scourging, crown of thorns, and the three nails. In the symbols on the hood of the red cope, the deeper meaning of symbolism comes to the fore. The cross, chalice, and host stand for Christ's redemptive act on the cross which is reenacted in the Eucharist. The living waters flowing from this once-for-all sacrifice 
represent the sacrament of baptism through which the baptized are united with Christ in his saving sacrifice. White chasuble with blessed virgin figure. This chasuble is made of silk given as a gift to Mother Louise Waltz by the first native Chinese students, Buddhists, who came to our college in the fall of 1930. It has embroidered on its orphrey one of the first figures designed in our vestment department according to the Boiron style. The vestment was made by Sister Flavia Langer in the late 1930s. Another close-up view shows the fine stitches in making the face and hair and the well-chosen color selection of floss to make the halo. This vestment is the counterpart of the Blessed Virgin Chasuble. On the back of the Chasuble, Christ the King, Rex Regum, King of Kings, reigns as the High Priest from the Orphrey Cross. In his left hand he holds the orb, the symbol of his sovereignty. The figure of Christ stands out prominently on the vestment. Much of this is due to shifting the direction of the stitching. For example, the background stitches are horizontal, those of the face are vertical, and the halo stitches radiate outward from the head of Christ. This vestment was made by Sister Verda Bonenstingel in the 1940s. One of our tabernacle curtains features the triple sanctus, holy, 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 which is arranged in a circle around the host and chalice. The seven sacraments are represented by the seven streams of water flowing from the base of the chalice and host. The never-ending streams give abundant life to the palm trees, the trusting, faithful Christians, which stretch out their roots to the stream and bear ripe, luscious fruit. John work. It is a masterpiece of craftsmanship. Only after one knows what drawn work is can a person appreciate it. Bella Gillen, who was Sister Agnesia Wagner, made this particular elb. Both are sisters of St. Benedict's Convent. The following is the process. First of all, the design was made by Sister Justina Knapp and then stamped on the linen. The piece of linen to be worked on in this case, 3 yards by 18 inches, to be the insertion at the bottom of the elb, was stretched on a frame and the solid embroidery was done wherever needed. This consisted of a raised outline stitch in some cases thinner, in others thicker, depending on the desired effect. This process, called cording, was done by taking three or four threads, holding them down, and sewing over them again and again. The padding only appeared on the right side, nothing on the wrong side. This is not crocheting. In order to achieve the uniform squared netting effect, a certain pattern was followed. Only one panel could be drawn out at a time. Four threads were drawn out the whole length of the panel and the whole width of the panel, and four threads left in. This was repeated until the panels were finished in this manner. The length had to be finished first. No one thread could ever be stopped until all the way round so the frame had to be adjusted again and again, from panel to panel, a very tedious and difficult task. After all threads were drawn, the remaining threads were pinched together and sewn over and over until a solidity was attained. One row was done at a time the long way. Then the width was done row by row. Gradually and automatically the small squares appeared. A cutwork altar cloth was made by Sister Hildegard Hassler at the end of the 19th century or in the beginning of this century. It was used in the old convent chapel, which was in the north wing of the second and third floors of the main convent building, and then in the present newer chapel as the feast day altar cloth until it was replaced by the cutwork altar cloth with the lily design. 
The slides for the newer altar cloth follow this slide. Cut work altar cloth with lily design, more contemporary one. This altar cloth, one of a set of five altar cloths for our chapel's five altars, was made to celebrate the great feast days of the year. Sister Agnesia Wagner, who made four of these cloths, and Sister Claudette Skoblik, who embroidered one for a side altar, completed these cloths in the late 1930s, about the same time as the angel set vestments were embroidered. The conventionalized lily design embroidered on the cope and dalmatics of the angel set vestments is here adapted to cut work. And here we view the end of the cloth which hangs down at the side of the altar. Here we see the entire back view of the extended angel cope. Note the lily design, the border of the 17 angels around the bottom. Each is different. And above all, note on the hood the symbol of the Trinity. The Trinity symbol of the hood consists of three interlaced circles which signify the three persons in one God. The hand with the orb of sovereignty refers to God the Father as Creator the Eucharistic chalice and host to the Son, the Redeemer, the Dove to the Holy Spirit, the Sanctifier and Life Giver. These close-ups show how Sister Justina Knapp moved from the uh, Cupid-like uh, angels in the first set of vestments to the more, um, well, that she called them Levitical uh, style uh, angels in the last uh, angel set that was made. The symbols of the creed are featured on the two front panels of the cope. There are 12 symbols in all, one for each article of faith in the creed. They begin with, I believe in one God the Father, creator of heaven and earth. Close-up slides of each symbol are given next in this presentation. God the Father created the universe. That statement embodies the first article of the creed. The eye in the triangle is a symbol for the triune God. The creation is represented by the sun and the moon and the earth. In the second article of faith, the Christian professes belief in Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father. To symbolize Jesus Christ, God and man, who died on the cross in order to reconcile us to the Father, the artist has used the cross with the word Phileus, that is, Son, inscribed on it, and the abbreviation of Jesus Christ at the left of the cross, and the Kiro, the monogram of Jesus Christ, on its right. The nativity of Jesus Christ, the third article, is portrayed by familiar symbols. For example, the stars and the manger. The letter M stands for Mary, his virgin mother. The monogram for Jesus Christ plus the halo is placed in the crib. The symbols for the crucifixion on the cope, the next article of faith recalls several events of the crucifixion. Namely, for the event of Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate, the Roman emblem SPQR is used. For was crucified, the cross with the key row on it, and the inscription INRI on the cross, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. For died and was buried, the tomb hewn out of a rock. On the third day he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven. This is the Easter message in the fifth article. Three panels depict the Easter event, the greatest feast of the church. On the left is the Easter candle, the great symbol for the risen Christ, the light of the world. In the center is the banner of victory. The dove is the traditional symbol of the Holy Spirit, perhaps because of the scriptural references to the dove at the baptism of Jesus. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church is the ninth article. Again, the church is portrayed as the boat, as on the hood of the purple cope, which we have viewed. Christ abides with his church. His monogram, the Kiro, and the now familiar Alpha and Omega 
are inscribed on the sail of the boat. I believe in the forgiveness of sin. Again, all power resides in Christ, represented by the Kiro. He has given to the apostles and their successors his power to forgive sins. And here is the symbol illustrating the resurrection of the body. It immediately interests us and holds our attention. It has become the symbol of the resurrection. Above the butterfly is a glowing sun with rays. Therefore, the symbolism seems to be that just as the butterfly emerging from the darkness of the cocoon has been transformed into new life, so the person after the death experience is transfigured in his resurrected glorified body and bursts into the newness of incredibly ecstatic life in God. This slide shows the chasuble, which is part of the angel vestment uh, of which we have just been showing the cope. Now this chasuble uh, has symbols of the Mass, or what we call the Liturgy of the Eucharist today, and uh, it um, shows each part of the Mass, beginning with the penitential rites, the offertory, the uh, consecration, and the communion, and the closing. So it, it's, uh, it's a complete set of symbols for the Eucharistic prayers. The first symbol, the scale, at the bottom of the chasuble, refers to the penitential rite of the Mass. We ask God to counterbalance our sins and failings with His mercy, hence the scale. No matter how great our sins, God's mercy always balances them. In other words, we straighten ourselves out with God before we celebrate the Mass. Next on the chasuble, we have two symbols relating to the Gospel book which contains the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospel book is specially honored at solemn celebrations by the rite of incensing. This honor is given to the Gospel book because it represents Christ's presence in his word. The two candles on either side of the Gospel book further emphasize the belief in the presence of Christ in his word. The next symbol, also on the front of the chasuble, begins the liturgy of the Eucharist. The chalice and host offertory symbol, or as it is now called, presentation of the gifts, represent the bread and wine, the primary gifts for the sacrifice meal. The meaning of the topmost symbol, the washing of the hands, is self-explanatory. The simple white host of the offertory symbol now stands forth separated from the cup. Jewels have been added to the full halo around the host, to the purple cross in the host, and to the cup. The cross plus the halo is exclusively the symbol for Jesus Christ. All speaks the presence of the Christ in this mystery here and now. On this slide we see the cross and a palm branch. We are strengthened by a final blessing symbolized by the cross, to go forth and act out the love of Christ and his victory, symbol of the palm branch, during our journey through life. The symbol below the cross and palm branch is composed mainly of an eagle. The eagle is a symbol of St. John the Evangelist. Like an eagle which soars higher than other birds, so St. John in his gospel speaks more eloquently of the divinity of Christ than the other evangelists. An antipendium is a hanging in front of an altar in a church. On this white antipendium, there is a jeweled cross and palm branches. Not only is the cross a Christian symbol, it is also found as a symbol in both pre-Christian and non-Christian cultures in its cosmic or natural signification. The cross is one of the oldest symbols in Christianity. It is the sign of redemption. The jeweled cross is an early Christian symbol of Christ's triumph over sin and death. The palm branches, likewise, signify victory. The red antipendium is used especially for Pentecost. It was made about 1940 by Sister Bernadita Brauchmann. On it are the symbols of the Kiro, 
the monogram of Jesus Christ and the lamp. The lamp embroidered in the center is among the oldest Christian symbols. It can be found in the burial places in the catacombs, one of the earliest gathering places for the Christians. Not only the vestments, but also anything that was used in liturgical worship or in the life of the church was uh, carefully embroidered to make it beautiful in its use in, the, in worship. Here we see verses which hold the small altar cloths which are placed on the altar during Mass, and uh, uh, they also were highly decorated. And also the verses or the purse that we uh, carried uh, uh, communion into the sick were very carefully embroidered. Everything that had to do with worship was made beautiful. A noteworthy example of the embroidery work done by the sisters in the vestment department was not connected with vestments as such, but it was this panel which was embroidered for one of our benefactors. It is a large panel of 24 inches by 38 inches featuring St. George. George Hutter was the contractor for the building of the St. Cloud Hospital in 1928, won the hearts of the sisters. They wanted to give him a special gift, and so the Sister Bernadita Brockman embroidered this panel. The Hutter family still have the original panel, which took 1,800 hours of labor, and 185 shades of thread were used. Its exceptional beauty prompted Mother Louisa Waltz to ask the sisters to make another copy for the sisters. This second copy is often used in our exhibits to show the marvelous work of the sisters in the vestment department. We honor the sisters who dedicated much of their religious life to the Ministry of Liturgical Arts in establishing the vestment department. First of all, credit must be given to Sister Willibalda Sherbo, who was really the foundress of the Sisters Monastery in Minnesota, but in particular of the vestment department. Mother Willibalda was a member of St. Walburg Abbey and among the f one of the first groups to come to America. She had received training in the Royal Academy of Art in Bavaria. There she learned the art of needlework. When she came to Minnesota, one of the first ways in which the community was able to make a living was through teaching embroidery work. Mother Willibalda taught not only students that came to the sisters, but all the sisters learned the art. No matter how small the convent, both in St. Cloud and then later in St. Joseph, she set up a, a needlework department, which then developed into the vestment department. She certainly was the influence for Sister Justina Knapp, who joined the community in 1880. And she died 1954. Most of those years she directed the vestment department and created most, most of the designs. She no doubt was the influence for sister, her sister, Sister Felicitas Knapp, who joined two years later. She was a well-known artist who made beautiful costumes for the drama department of the Academy. So needlework came natural to her, and she was responsible for many of the vestments that have been shown in this video. It is impossible to name all of the sisters who worked in the vestment department during the 110 years of its, of its existence. To point out a few that were mentioned in the video, in the top left photo, Sister Bernadita Brockman, who embroidered St. George, is shown to the right. The photo to the right, Sister Flavia, and in the left lower photo, to the extreme left, is Sister Anne-Marie Schuwater. Both of them spent most of their religious life in this ministry of liturgical arts. For this legacy 
of love of beauty and of love for the liturgy, we give thanks.